Our next book is by Elizabeth Stroud. It's Olive Again. People either didn't know how they felt about something or they chose never to say how they felt about something, and this is why he missed Olive Kitteridge. Uh, so says crusty, life-disappointed Jack Kennison at the opening of Elizabeth Strout's new book, Olive Again, bringing back the heroine of her beloved Pulitzer Prize winner. And fess up, you've been missing Olive too. Uh, right? A kind of, when I started reading this, a sort of sense of immediate calm came over me. On the very first page, as I entered the sort of the familiar and oh so welcome territory of Crosby, Maine, where all these momentous things happen in a very matter of fact way, as if they're just life. Um, Olive turns out to be the kind of person who just keeps on keeping on in her forthright manner, speaking up. Um, unnodding and re-nodding her relationship with Jack, antagonizing her son over the phone, huffing about a baby shower out, out, uh, before helping to deliver the baby, and reassuring a friend, you know, Cindy, if you should be dying, if you do die, the truth is we're all just a few steps behind you. So reassuring. This is Olive in Autumn, facing mortality and memories, and rarely has a character felt more alive. Hi, everybody. Um, let me just tell you first, I think, I, I think librarians are rock stars. I really do. I think you guys are so cool and so important. And, um, you know, well, my own childhood was obviously, well, not, you don't know that, so it wasn't obvious. But the point is, um, you know, libraries played a huge role in my life. But since then, I have also had the chance to visit many libraries and I have seen the evolution of what a library does for our society today especially and I just think you guys are great so okay yeah um so she's a strange one that Olive Kittredge when Olive showed up the very first time I was unloading the dishwasher and it was as though she was standing behind me and I could hear in her head so clearly as she was thinking about the guests at her son's wedding, it's high time everyone went home. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I have to get that down. So I did right away. And then I ended up writing Olive Kittredge. Sometimes people ask me where I came up with the form of that book. Um, and it's the form that I use again in, all, in Olive again. I thought at first, with the original Olive Kittredge, I thought, I'm going to write a book called The Olive Stories. But I began to see that Olive was a lot to take. She was for me, and therefore she would be for a reader. And so I got very interested in how others in the community saw her, because I'm so interested in point of view and how in a small town or even in a building in New York, we think we know somebody, but we only know a sliver of them. And somebody else knows a different sliver of them. And that was very, very interesting to me. So I thought about the people in the community who knew Olive, the piano player who only knows her by her signature wave above her head, or Olive's former student who has come up the coast to consider his death, Every person, which is real in true life, sees only, as I said, a sliver of Olive or of anyone. And this became very interesting to me, and so the manner in which the book is written reflects that. And Olive remained vivid to me as I wrote her in that first book, right up until the last scene where she is lying with her head on Jack Kennison's chest and she thinks about life. She did not want to leave it yet. So I thought, okay, that is that. Done with you. Finished. And then a few years ago, I found myself in a European city alone for the weekend, and I went to a local cafe with my computer, and bam, that woman just showed up again. <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. It was very odd, because there was absolutely no warning. This time, I saw her nosing her car into the parking lot of the marina, and she was as vivid to me as she had been before. 
So I sat in that cafe and wrote scenes of her on my computer, which is not how I usually work. I usually work by hand at the beginning anyway, but there she was. And so I typed up what I saw her do and what I heard her think. And I was happily surprised to realize in that chapter that she had married Jack Kennison. And when they took a trip to Europe, he went first class while she sat in coach, <laughs> squished up against the bulkhead. She thought going first class was obscene. Anyway, throughout that weekend, I sketched out the chapter in the book called Poet. And I came home, and then I almost forgot about her again, except apparently I had not forgotten about her. Because the next year, as I was going through old papers in my studio, I came upon a folder with olive scraps written on it. And I opened it up, and I realized these were scenes written by hand on notebook paper that I had never developed in the first book. And as, look at the, as I was looking at them that day, I almost felt like she was poking me in the ribs and saying, come on, come on, let's get on with this. People ask me why I about, write about Maine so much, and the answer is, it's where I'm from. And I mean, it's really where I'm from. My ancestors go back to the 1600s. So these are the people that I know the best. Even if I haven't lived in the state for over 30 years, these are my people. And in the case of my people, I'm talking about people who came from Puritan stock. It's a separate slice of America. And this is a world that is disappearing, and truthfully, I think it should disappear. <laughs> its time is over. The world is moving on. But when I write about Olive Kittredge, this is who I'm writing about. However, Olive lives among other people as well, and there is a social class network that goes on anywhere, and this is true in Crosby, Maine. At the top of the hierarchy are the Congregationalists, I don't know how much you guys know about New England Congregationalists, but they're very plain. Anyway, Olive is one. If not in practice, this is who she was, at least culturally. But let me tell you about a few characters in this new book and how I came to find them. Doris and Phil Ringrose are old, and they are Congregationalists. A relative of Doris's arrived on the Mayflower a fact of which she is immensely proud. This couple goes around at Thanksgiving dressed up as pilgrims, and they give talks on the first Thanksgiving. But here's the thing. When I was going through my olive scraps, I found many, many different attempts to try and write about this couple, and they all failed. But Phil Ringrose has a bathroom designed to look like an old-fashioned outhouse. And boy, did I want to use that. So I finally decided in this new book to have Kaylee Callahan, a young Irish girl from a working class background, clean house for the ring roses. And she is quietly nauseated by the man's bathroom. And Kaylee's mother is exactly right when she says to Kaylee, you're nothing but an Irish girl working for them. This is one reason the women at the end of their fashion show at the Silver Squares at the Congregational Church don't even speak to Kaylee after she has played the piano for it, because in a true, very true way, she just doesn't exist for them. Another thing I noticed, and this is in many, many different folders, pieces of this, what I'm about to tell you, but apparently for many years, I had also been trying to figure out how to write the line, he's been seen out back naked watering the tulip beds. <laughs> I was astonished to find how many papers I had with that line on it. <laughs> and the different ways all of them failed of using it. And then I realized Olive Kittredge would say that about Phil Ringrose. There is also, in this new Olive book, Denny Pelletier of Franco, French-Canadian, Background. In Maine, these difference, differences mattered a generation ago. Denny, who is old, thinks of how he only finished high school so he could stare at the gorgeous young woman who had befriended him at school. Otherwise, he would have quit at 16 to go work in the mills, which is what he did at the age of 18. He went to work in the mills until they closed down. This is true, this kind of narrative. 
His children are now all educated, and today these differences do not matter so much. So there is progress being made out there, no matter what we may think. <laughs> there are other cultural differences that work in this book. When a woman from New York City arrives in town, she puts on her straw hat as she walks through an art display, and the woman from Maine who is with her says, you look like a tourist. And the New Yorker says with innocent honesty, I am a tourist. These are the tiny ways people communicate with each other, the way they try to keep their turf special. It seems, unfortunately, to be part of a human need to keep one's turf special. But when a Somali home health care worker comes to Olive's house, Olive is glad to see her. What did you think, Olive demands, that I am some ignorant fool? She's no ignorant fool, Olive. Even as she clings to her place in Maine like a barnacle, she is warily open to the changes the world is bringing her way. And always there is weather. I learned to write about weather by reading the journals of John Cheever many years ago, another New England person in his heritage. And the weather, especially in Maine, if not everywhere else, is, determines a great deal about what these characters go through. The sun in Maine is a particular sun. It slants across the earth in its own way. And when it does, boy, is that a thing of beauty. There are windy days and snowy days and cloudy days all here for these characters to live with. But the sun plays a particular part, almost a character, in this book in the chapter called Light. A friend of mine from Maine who read the book said I may be responsible for increased tourism in February in Maine, because this is the light that I speak of in that chapter. And there are also and always plenty of autumn leaves that fall. Olive is going through the late, very late autumn of her life. So I settled down and I wrote this new book. And it turns out I was not done with Olive at all, nor was she done with me. The woman continues to surprise me, continues to enrage me, continues to sadden me, and somehow she continues to make me love her. I hope you feel the same. Thank you.